What's the class uh, that's first and most at risk here? So the first is going to be Medicare Part D drugs. These are drugs that are um, purchased at your, you know, your typical pharmacy and are, are taken at home. So it's a very broad, wide list that we're going to see. And, and what the government is trying to figure out now is how they can truncate that list into, call it the top 10. Those are going to be the most impacted over the near term. And I think as we move forward here, they're planning on adding an incremental 10 to 20 drugs per year. So it's really a conversation we're going to be having over in perpetuity, um, or at least for the next few years into the end of the decade. Remind me what the industry jargon is for these. It, it, it's not like bio. What is the name? What are they called? So these are Part B, and then Part D drugs are administered in a provider setting, in a doctor's office, in a hospital. So that would be the other. That would be the other end of the spectrum, and those drugs are going to be impacted in the 2028 timeframe. So it's Part D first, and then Part B second two years later. So we're going to have these conversations around what drugs are impacted in 2026. Those are the Part D and then Part B in 2028. And again, these lists are going to evolve as the government adds more and more single drugs to their list as they try to curtail pricing. And Eli Lilly CEO David Ricks did tell us a couple of months ago it was already impacting R&D and term, them figuring out which drugs to invest in, you know, which ones to bring to market in the years to come. Uh, why do you think, even though I mentioned uh, Eli Lilly CEO, why do you think Bristol Myers is potentially most at risk here from a revenue point of view? Well, Bristol has a, a lot of exposure over the near term. They have a, they have a blood thinner, Eliquis. Um, they've got Revlimid, um, which they acquired as part of the Celgene deal. So there are, there's a lot of drugs that they have over the next couple of years that are going to probably be impacted. And then for Part B, they've got Updevo, obviously the big cancer treatment. So Bristol might be one of the, the bigger um, you know, kind of targets as we look at the drug companies on an individual basis over the next few years. And clearly their multiple has been impacted the most, arguably, as they're trading, you know, less than half times, uh, less than half the S&P multiple here. So I think investors are obviously very keyed in on how Bristol kind of navigates the next few years as they deal with several products that are going to be under scrutiny. And, you know, there's so many big picture questions I want to ask. How much could this affect the prices consumers are paying? Is this negotiations or are these price controls? Depending on whether you ask the industry or the administration, you get two very different answers. And maybe uh, court uh, lawsuits could turn this around. But I also want to make sure we talk about what you think could happen more near term, which is the potential for deal making. Wh who to whom? Uh, what, what would you be on the lookout for here? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think we've started to see some of it play out over the past couple of years. Pfizer has been a very aggressive deal maker uh, really since 2019, 2020. Uh, Merck has done two, you know, fairly sizable transactions, both north of 10 billion, uh, one in 2021, um, one earlier this year. So we're starting to see a flurry kind of come in. There have been some small transactions announced recently. Eli Lilly, as you mentioned, has been one. Novartis has been another one. So we're seeing the industry kind of proactively um, manage around the drug pricing risk. A lot of that is either finding commercial assets that are going to offset the pressure right away or as soon as possible, and others that are, you know, maybe less impacted or less under the gun, I would argue Lilly would be one of them, are looking at pipeline assets that they don't need right away, but surely help the longer-term story. Lilly just this morning, of course, uh, completing the acquisition of Sigalon Therapeutics, if I'm saying that correctly. So then, Biotech, which has been struggling, uh, broadly speaking, does it get a fill up here? I mean, is that kind of is this a traditional kind of pharma to biotech acquisition story or is it a little more nuanced than that? I think so. I mean, the, the FTC has been, you know, very rigorous around their process for allowing large scale deals to go through. And that's why you really haven't seen the pharma to pharma merger of equals that we're, you know, maybe used to seeing that, you know, a couple decades prior. We still have Pfizer, CGen that has not closed. Uh, Amgen Horizon is the second biggest deal. Um, that has not closed either. So we're probably looking at smaller biotech transactions. Unfortunately, the sector broadly has not really responded all that well to a lot of M&A activity. Investors just haven't been able to draft off of the, the single stocks or the one-offs and play the entire sector, which is 
you know, very frustrating. And maybe perhaps the specter, because the specter of more, you know, price controls or negotiations hangs over the whole space for, for potentially some years to come. Jared, thanks. Well, for now, we appreciate it.